Hello and welcome everyone to our 16th Virtual Research Cafe 10.0. I'm Frank Gomez here at the Chancellor's Office. Uh, behind the scenes, we have Monica Alacon, Admin Analyst for STEMnet. Much thanks to her for working out all of the logistics and in publicizing today's events. The goal of the cafe is to help foster research collaborations across the CSU and catalyze the submission of joint proposals. The cafe brings together CSU assistant profs to share their works in a relaxed setting for 10 minutes, the reason why we call it 10.0. We hope you'll find opportunities for collaboration and or learn about a new area of research that may impact your own program. Feel free to contact any presenter in the chat box when they're not presenting. At the end of the three presentations, we'll all come together to answer questions. We'll be monitoring the chat box to call questions from the audience. So let's begin. Once again, we have three wonderful speakers presenting a snapshot of their work. Our first speaker is Eva De and excuse me, Heda Yadipur from the Department of Electrical Engineering at Cal State Long Beach. Ava, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, so my screen is shared. Uh, thank you for having me here. Um, um, Ava, I'm OK with Ava, but uh, in my own language, I'm called Ava, Ava Heda Yadipur. I came to US in 2016, pursuing my PhD in electrical engineering in University of Tennessee. Finished my PhD in August, 2020, and I got hired here at the wonderful Long Beach CSULB University. I'm an assistant professor here. And my uh, area of expertise and area of interest is bioimplantable devices, designing of the sensors and um, semiconductor devices. I'm going to give you a, a snapshot of my research, starting from uh, this is slide. I want to paint you a picture. I want to paint you a picture for a near future. You are running for your train or your plane. You are having a smart contact lens that is detecting the object in your path. It's telling you if you can uh, jump, uh, if you can move with good speed, or if you want to uh, slow down, maybe your smartwatch or your smartphone is checking the train and the plane for delay, so it can notify you if you're having any delay. You are running toward your train and you get some notifications. For example, your blood glucose is falling. You need to know, so you need to eat something sweet. And you're gonna ignore that notification because it's not you are, you're running. Of course, you are uh, needing more glucose. Uh, finally, you get a notification telling you that your train has been delayed and you have a sigh of relief. All these notifications, annoying or not, it's the reality. And it may seem unbelievable now, but on the top right corner of this picture, I want to show you a phone from 2002. Not that long ago. I kind of think that 2002 was seven years ago, maybe, not 20. But this was the phones that we had back then. We have came a long way from these phones to the, all these variables that you're seeing on the right side using in the commercial world now. And as you can see in the plot, the use of variables from 2016 has almost doubled every year from a market that wasn't that big is project is projected to have a market of 51.6 billion by the year 2022. We are using our variables as tracking devices for our uh, sport. We are starting to have variables as medical devices to help doctors uh, notify them when we are having a condition and it's getting more and more aggregated in every aspect of our life. When we are talking about variables, we need to point out the characteristics that is really important for us. When we are having a variable, we need it to be reliable. Apple watches weren't FDA approved until 2018. They were just FDA approved a few years ago. But because it was more like a hobby device, tracking device, and not a medical device, it was acceptable to use them. Power consumption. We do not want to carry a big battery when we are having variable devices. Variable devices 
need to have a very small power consumption. They need to last very long with a very small battery. And any, date, any uh, measurement that these wearable devices do, they need to transfer it somehow for processing. We cannot have computers, big computers, analyzing this huge amount of data on chip. We prefer them to transfer them. So data transfer is very important too. Security is another area that I'm gonna look into and show you examples of how we can improve that. And as always, material size and flexibility is very important too. Talking about all variables, these are the variables that have been really important for us in the next couple of years. Because of COVID infection, we have been working on pulse oximeter, temperature sensors that can detect fever, and impedance sensor that can detect the well-being and health of our lungs. I have worked on all of these sensors. My job is to implement good, small, reliable, with low power consumption sensors that can be used in various applications. The picture that you're seeing on the left is a secure encoder and decoder. The picture on the middle, and I have the size for it, as you can see, is a fraction of a millimeter, one tenth of a millimeter. Is a temperature sensor that we have designed. And on the right side is an impedance sensor. It's, it's actually the whole system with the battery, with the control unit, with the power consumption control unit and the data transfer that is smaller than a credit card. And we use that to wear it around the lung and can tell you the impedance of your chest area. So you're gonna understand if there is any fluid accumulation in your lungs. Uh, all these sensors need to come together and work together. Looking at this block diagram, you can see that our temperature sensor that itself has a few blocks that can work separately, can come together with, the, with our imp impedance sensor that also has a few blocks, and we can put them together to have a whole system, a system that have securing blocks, control blocks, and power management blocks. Any sensor that we design, we test that a lot. We test this at using bench top, the test, then we move to a human experience. Uh, only my impedance sensor was uh, IRA clear to be used on humans. We are working toward getting approvals for our other sensors, but we have many bench top devices that we use to test these sensors. Temperature sensors can be tested in uh, temperature chambers, as you can see for the temperature sensors that I show you the integrated circuit for, we are seeing a very linear in increase in the range of temperature that is common for the area that we live in and for human body. Same thing with the impedance sensor. We do test them uh, by detecting their data. Our impedance sensor had a wireless transmitter Hence, we could send the data and detect it using an Arduino, uh, translating the impedance data into a small pulses that can be carried away in a, for a range of distance. We are seeing the pictures for 30 centimeter uh, apart and three meter apart, showing no difference when it comes to detection of the data. We use these uh, sensors a lot. The temperature sensor, the application is very evident. We propose that to be a sensor for uh, IoT nodes, for health nodes, for detecting of uh, electronic, bigger electronic chips, and the same for the impedance sensor. The first application that we devised and tested it for was to wear it around, around the chest so that it can detect the impedance of the chest area. The second one was translation of sign language. We had the impedance sensor as an array around the wrist with, a, with 16 conductive copper strips. And by wearing that and moving your wrist, you can detect different impedance points because the muscles and the tendons in your wrist moves, they're gonna produce different impedances, different resistance different replies to electronic stimulation. And seeing that, seeing that differences, you can tell what sign that the fist is showing. This has been a work that has been also proposed by other research group and is becoming 
it is getting very close to commercial applications um, delivered by other research groups. So apart from these sensors, we said that we are going to be needing other blocks. One of the most important blocks is the security. And I have been working a lot on implementing new ways of security on these sensors. One of these ways is using hardware security. Most of IoT nodes or the smart watches that we use today have no modes of coding their data or they use very power consuming blocks to code their data. When, for example, you want to send the information from your watch to the web or from the web to, to your computer, these data transfers, uh, security is their, um, is their weak link. Is, there, is the weak link when it comes to designing these variable devices. If we can have the same modes of security, uh, separated from software and also implemented on the hardware, we're going to have more secure devices. In this um, project, we used chaotic security. So chaos is when two signals are very uh, messy, but can be synchronized. If you have system that have the same characteristic, they, they can be synchronized when showing you the signal. I'm gonna move to this video that we made. So here implementing our chaotic security, which is basically uh, hardware resistors, capacitors, and nonlinear devices, we could produce this red and blue signal that are very chaotic. You cannot tell high or low or any data from that blue or uh, light, uh, from red and light blue signal, but when you receive the answer and decode it using your chaotic receiver, because your receiver is made with same characteristic of the transmitter, you're gonna be able to say high and low apart. We did, did it with FPGA, uh, we are uh, looking to implement it on chip. And as this is my last slide, we are looking to have the, the security multiple sensors and include people from a medical realm into our project so they can, can start testing and going toward commercial devices. Uh, if any of you need sensor design or uh, variable IoT nodes, uh, I am the person who you can contact. Um, and thank you for giving me your time. Thank you, Ava, for a very, very interesting talk. I'm sure there'll be a number of questions for you uh, during our uh, Q&A session. Our next speaker is Jason Burke from CSU San Bernardino and the Department of Chemistry. Okay, uh, thank you, Frank. Um, so the title, um, I'm an assistant professor, chemistry and biochemistry. Uh, the title of my talk is Biochemical Characterization of cancer missense mutations in the retinoblastoma protein. So I have a confession to make here. I kind of pulled a fast one on you guys and changed my title up um, and added some jargon. Uh, so I did this because this is going to illustrate um, kind, of, kind of what we do and the, the big ideas in our research here. So we'll start off simple here with the retinoblastoma protein. This is the structure of a protein. Proteins are made of chains of amino acids. Um, and they fold up into three dimensions, kind of like a clump of spaghetti. Uh, so the ret RB or the retinoblastoma protein is a tumor suppressor protein. Um, and what that means is that it under, under normal circumstances, when it's carrying out its normal day-to-day -day function, that's consistent with keeping cells healthy and on track. Uh, when its function is compromised, then that leads to trouble and is consistent with formation of tumors and cancer. Um, so in our research, we use uh, cancer genomics information, um, which has uh, really been produced quite a bit in the last 10 years. Um, and a lot of it is aggregated in this, in this data website, CBioPortal. So we mine the data for uh, what we call missense mutations. And here's an example of um, a list of missense mutations that come up when we look for RB. There are pages and pages of these, so some of them look redundant, but that's because they show up in um, different types of cancer, the same mutation over and over. And then we can take these and map these back onto the structure 
And so this is what we're interested in studying. Uh, there are these uh, 100, over 100 sites um, where amino acids have changed, 100 sites of recurrent missense mutations that have shown up again and again in cancers and these uh, cancer genomes that are being sequenced. And we're interested in understanding how they affect the function of RB. Um, so before we jump into that, I'm going to define a little bit more jargon. So what is a missense mutation? Um, now, a lot of us have had a crash course in this uh, thanks to COVID, but I'll define it anyway um, on my own terms and in terms of biochemistry and structural biology. So um, the central dogma of molecular biology is you have DNA, which gets translated into protein. So you can have a sequence of DNA uh, and can translate into a protein um, with a, a name like RAT. You may think of RAT. I think of arginine, alanine, threonine. So the arginine um, is a relatively large amino acid, um, and that's shown here as an R. It's got a positive charge, and this gives it certain properties, certain chemical properties, particularly in the context of a protein. Now, a missense mutation, that's a change to a DNA codon that changes the amino acid sequence of a protein. So this happens at the DNA level, translated to the protein level. So if you have a nice long vacation, you know, you go to the beach, exposed to some sun, um, you eat some barbecue, you know, maybe you fill your tank up with gas, you're exposed to mutagens constantly. Um, and so one chance mutagen might cause a, a misread in your DNA and change uh, the protein rat into something that is diametrically opposed mortal enemy, a cat. Um, and no less different when you're looking at uh, the, the, the changes in the amino acids and their chemical properties. So we've got, we've got from R and rat or arginine, to C in cat or cysteine, which is now smaller, it doesn't have a positive charge. And so it's fundamentally different in terms of, of how it's gonna uh, act in the protein. Okay, so this is what we're interested in, in terms of RB. So this nomenclature we're familiar with is R1C, one being the, the position of the amino acid that's changed. So arginine, at the first position changed to cysteine. <clears throat> Okay, so this gives us a higher resolution picture of where cancer is happening on the protein. Um, the next thing we're interested in is how these mutations might be disrupting the protein's normal function. So the retinoblastoma protein, uh, in the course of its normal day, um, it regulates proteins that, um, are, that generate the proper structure of chromatin. Chromatin is a three-dimensional structure of DNA. Um, and so we see some of those structured interactions here. So a hypothesis might be that you know, a mutation uh, that happens near this binding site for this protein um, could compromise this interaction and, and RB is no longer properly regulating chromatin structure, okay? A similar thing is going on here with an interaction. So RB uh, regulates proteins that also regulate the cell cycle, tells the cell when to divide. Um, cancer is fundamentally a, a disease of, of uh, the cell cycle getting hijacked. And so if there's a mutation that's close to where that cell cycle protein binds RB on that structure, that might disrupt that interaction and cause changes to the way RB interact, uh, regulates that function. <clears throat> uh, so there's a, a review that came out recently about the hallmarks of cancer. And so these are all the, the kinds of changes that happen to cells uh, that, that cause them to become cancer cells. And um, the interactions with cell proteins and RB are actually pretty well studied. And it's shown that if you disrupt these interactions, um, you can, you can uh, create the hallmarks of cancer, such as sustaining proliferative cell signaling, evading growth suppression. And let's see, my zoom bar is in the way here. Uh, enabling replicative immortality, okay? So cells have started to divide. They're divided out of, divided out of control. They're no, no longer paying attention to cell signals. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, similarly, um, uh, disruption to interactions with chromatin proteins can cause genome instability and mutation, all right? So these are the foundations for our idea for studying missense mutations, um, how they might be affecting RB and, and leading to cancer um, and making cancer worse. Uh, there's also this idea that any particular mutation might just cause the protein to unfold. So, you know, I, I described it as a glob of spaghetti. It's actually an intricately folded glob of spaghetti. Uh, for which its three-dimensional structure is very, uh, very important for its function. So if, if some mutation happens that uh, causes a 
amino acid to be a, a square peg in a round hole, um, that's gonna cause problems for the overall structure of the protein. Um, okay, so uh, we so done in the lab. So the, this research starts off with Anthony Castro. He's our undergraduate research extraordinaire. This is a figure that he made for uh, his poster that he presented that describes one of our experiments. So in this experiment, <clears throat> we're looking to changes, uh, looking to major changes in the stability of the protein that are caused by particular mutations. Um, so this shows uh, a little cartoon of a barbell looking thing. That's our retinoblastoma protein. So these little orange diamonds are fluorescent dye molecules. As we heat this thing up um, in a little tube, uh, our fluorescent signal changes until our protein becomes unfolded. We add thermal energy to disrupt all the interactions that hold the protein together and it becomes unfolded. Uh, this transition is a measure of its stability. We call it the TM or melting temperature. So Anthony teamed up with um, Chad Mormon in the lab. Uh, he's an extraordinary human. He's working as a technician now. And they tested a bunch of our mutations. Um, any, you know, any, any particular cancer, you probably have one, one mutation to your RB, most likely, statistically. So we're looking at single mutations to, to the RB protein and, and those effects of those single mutations. And he was able to find a bunch of different melting temperatures for different mutant forms of RB. Uh, so this is the data presented another way. So you can see um, uh, out, of, out of our 101 mutations we looked to initially characterize here are 32. Uh, some of the proteins become less stable, um, which is what you'd expect kind of for a protein that's not functioning properly. Some of them become more stable, which is really interesting result that, uh, is uh, something we're going to study more. Um, and this one in particular becomes less stable, stable is a nice example of our R to C mutation. Uh, it goes from being an arginine, which has a nice charged interaction that holds two pieces of the protein together, a positive and negative charge, to a cysteine, which loses that charge. And so we have a less stable. So there's a structural justification for this uh, effect, <clears throat> which for this mutation that's seen in cancer. Um, one other experiment that's based on a structural hypothesis is done by Emma Wolf Saxon. She's a very good scientist in the lab. She was looking at a mutation that's next to our, our uh, cell cycle binding protein site uh, called E2F. Um, and for this one, uh, this particular mutation, the hypothesis is that because you know it's next to the it's next to this interaction, if we mutate it, it's probably not these two proteins probably aren't going to interact as well together, and that might cause um, well, that's consistent with, uh, with dysregulation of the, of the functions of this cell cycle protein. Um, so like unchecked proliferation and things like that. So Emma tested this, she, she did a binding experiment. She bound the RB and the E2F, the cell cycle protein, and then did the same experiment using a mutant version of the RB and found a different binding curve, which showed that the interaction is five times weaker actually. So that's, that's. That means that five times more often when this mutation is present, you know, E2F is not binding RB and it's doing other things. All right, so in conclusion, uh, future directions, we're gonna turn this research into a course-based undergraduate research experience, which will be starting in fall 2022. It looks like we're gonna be teaming up maybe with UC Santa Cruz. So we've got um, Cody the Coyote, Sammy the Slug, um, and involving undergrads in the research. And it's been supported by CSUSB, C Superb, and the NIH. Thanks. Thank you, Jason. And it's great that you have a lot of extraordinary people in your lab. Fascinating. Our next speaker is Jacqueline Bauman from Cal Poly Humboldt and the Department of Geology. Jackie. Great. Thank you all. I am thrilled to be here. So I'm Jackie Boffman, new faculty in the geology department here at the newly minted Cal Poly Humboldt. And I'm excited to talk to you about just one of the components of my research program. And, and the component I'm going to talk about today is, is my research that looks to and develop and then investigate the effectiveness of virtual reality geoscience field trips. And so science is of course, extremely collaborative and should be collaborative. And that's why this uh, virtual cafe is such a great idea. Thank you, Frank. Um, so I'd be remiss not to share with you some of the 
excellent undergraduate researchers that have thus far contributed to this work. Matt Donnelly is a computer science major at Bowdoin College, my uh, former institution where I was a visiting assistant professor. And he is the primary virtual reality developer. Adobe Nebua completed an extensive literature review as this is a new area of research for me. And Thais Carrillo is an art and education major who sculpted and designed our first virtual reality environment and contributed greatly to the accessibility mission of the project. And so in my first year at Bowdoin College, Thais enrolled in my intro geology class in 2018. And with Thais's permission, I wanna share that she's full-time in a wheelchair and the course involved four inaccessible field trips. And I quickly, though I think thoughtfully, uh, adapted the trips to be physically accessible for Thais. Um, but after the semester ended, her and I teamed up to embark on this journey with a mission of making field courses more accessible. And so of course the pandemic then hit, which only enhanced our interest and the uh, geology community's interest in virtual field options. And so lastly, in terms of collaborators, it's Dr. Stacey Dorr, an assistant professor at Colby College and a uh, computer scientist who could not do this work without her. So a little bit about me, in many ways, I look like a traditional and stereotypical geologist. I love the outdoors, I bike, and hike, I climb volcanoes during vacations to Guatemala, and I wear Patagonia vests and Arcteryx coats, and I am white and I am able-bodied. Uh, and that's okay, I am a great geologist, I love geology, I am an engaged and energetic educator, but this is not the only way to identify as a geologist. And so I think that's really important to remember in our field. So as a geologist, I personally also work in clean labs. I do math and teach math, sometimes on the window when we used up all the whiteboard space. I spend hours looking under the microscope, characterizing and selecting minerals to date for geochronology. I run and write computer programs and simulations and we write. We are all professional authors here in the land of uh, academia. Um, so there's so many skill sets that are conducive to being a geologist and we can wear many hats and, and fieldwork is just one of those hats. But fieldwork is an important hat. Uh, geology and many earth and physical sciences are inherently operational and field competency, competency is truly uh, one of the most marketable skills for a young geologist. And so my goal is not to like, cancel fields. All right, but it is to make the field more accessible, to bring those synthesis, to bring that spatial reasoning, to bring those aha moments um, uh, into a more inclusive and equitable space because geology is the least diverse physical science in terms of race and ethnicity. And one of the barriers is the field. Um, and so if we can lower the barrier to entry, hopefully we can also broaden participation in our discipline. And so here I am showing a real world image of a field site uh, in coastal Maine, where we have a basalt dike intruding and cross cutting into a regionally deformed metamorphic schist. And so the field is in an exceptional place uh, for us to do rock identification, consider the evolution of place and space to understand temporal relationships. That dike that is cross-cutting the rock, of course, has to be younger than the rock it cross-cuts. And so on the other side, we have the virtual environment, and this is a sculpted cartoon version, but it still lets us look at and investigate those temporal relationships and some important field relationships. Here is uh, another site. This is the Whaleback Anticline, a structural, uh, a big uh, anticline, so a big arc uh, that we see in Pennsylvania. And on one side, you see the real world image, and on the other is the virtual world. 
And this is created using photogrammetry. So it's a much more realistic space. And in fact, uh, in this virtual environment, we can uh, go in our jetpack, we can fly around, I can remove the vegetation so that it's much more realistic and, and give us a really nice look and insight into these uh, field spaces. So my active research program is investigating two different virtual reality conditions. It is comparing the student success in a desktop a VR condition that's using uh, sitting at their computer playing it like a video game like you can see on one side of your screen versus a headset immersive uh, virtual reality and the goal here is to have students investigate uh, the same field location do the same lab activity and compare their success so in a first early pilot iteration of this work uh, I just had 25 intergeology students who are running it currently this spring with another 60 intergeology students. Uh, the students had no difference in their self-perception of their skills. Um, and so what we see here is some of the results. So they were great at the training exercises. They were really good at navigating within these virtual spaces. They were eh, at the geology part, all right, but we've made some changes to the environment to make it more realistic. But what is really exciting is that there was no functional, uh, there, there was no difference in accuracy between the two desktop and immersive VR experiences. And so what that means is that that functional equivalency suggests that, all right, maybe we don't need the headset to achieve um, success in these virtual field trips and, and having students engage in them. And so the desktop, the web-based virtual reality is so much more accessible, so much more scalable. And that is uh, exciting, I think, for the future of virtual field trips. As far as engagement, the students were extremely engaged in both uh, environments. They increased accessibility as a top benefit. They thought they were both immersive and really exciting and they wanted more experiences. And so this was an exciting addition. Students love the field a lot of times, but not all students, all right? And so again, thinking about how can we bring these experiences into a more uh, equitable space that's lowering the barrier of entry for our future geoscientists or future uh, any of our physical scientists. And so what are some future directions for this research? Well, I want to uh, consider pre-visits to field areas. Maybe this will allow students to develop a field plan. Maybe it will allow them to have more physical and mental safety preparation so that they can feel safe and comfortable in the field, having seen it before, be better prepared. I'm excited to revisit field areas. If you've ever taught in the field, you think the field trip went amazing. You think you hit all of the learning goals. You read their papers when they come back and you're like, oh my gosh, you totally missed that. But what if we could revisit it easily? What if we could have student or instructor directed revisits to improve field skills and outcomes? And of course, can we access now inaccessible places? Maybe places that are inaccessible, due to the physical constraints of our students, due to their location. Can we go to glaciers? Can we go to the Himalaya? All right, we can't do that in our courses, but, but maybe in virtual reality we can. And can we engage large classrooms? Can we engage 150 person lecture halls that maybe wouldn't have the opportunity for field experiences otherwise? And so finally, last slide is what, what do I want? Who am I interested in collaborating with? Well, well really a lot of people. Um, we need computer scientists. We want an improved workflow for developing these realistic virtual reality environments so that it is easy. It has to be quick. It has to be easy or else it won't be that useful. And uh, this is a huge opportunity for student involvement as well. We've worked with a lot of computer science students or students just interested in gaining VR skills. They're marketable. They are excited uh, and the students are already playing in these spaces. So let's harness that. I'm certainly interested in science education researchers to help design and show the effectiveness or not of these VR environments for broadening access and participation. I am a trained structural geologist and I study large scale plate tectonics, but I am really excited to foray into this space. Uh, any field scientists, do you want to make your field and your discipline more accessible? Let's chat. And of course, those interested in broadening access and participation in STEM. You are more than welcome to reach out to me. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Jackie. Really, thanks to everyone, Ava, Jason, and Jackie. We now open it up to questions from anyone here. Either speak up, raise your hand. I see a question from Luella. Hi, um, I just wanted to ask Jackie, this is like probably not very important, but I was just curious in the study with the 20 other students, one, it was pretty interesting um, just to see that like the type of year I didn't, the type of like, yeah, virtual setting didn't matter too much. And then it was a little sad to see that it's much, it doesn't work as well as like a real life experience, although I guess that's a little intuitive. Um, but I was just wondering, when you said N was 25, is it like 25 students per group? Mm, in that first study, no, it's 25 total. So there was 12 in one condition and 13 in the other. Um, and then we were rerunning that study with some adjustments to the environment to make it more realistic, to hopefully increase the success of all of our students. Um, and that will have, so our current study that's going on um, right now has 60, so 30 in each condition. Okay. Yes, Matt. Yeah, hi, this is a question for Ava. Um, the, when you're the uh, sign language sensor system. Sure. Is that, uh, did you send a signal to those copper plates and then look at the change in impedance that way? Or are they like piezoelectric type materials that generate their own signal? Yeah, so the chip that we design has a small sine wave generator. The sine wave is not at a frequency or voltage that the human body can at any point sense. But yeah, we send this a small sinusoidal signal and we detect the changes that the input that the different veins, different uh, muscles make to those sinusoidal signals. And then we detect the changes. So is it, is it uh, did you choose sinusoidal for makes the processing easier or more discriminatory or could you have used DC? Yeah, the sinusoidal signal is safer for human body. Okay. So and then when it comes to biological, uh, testing biological cells and tissue, sinusoidal signal is the safest. Okay, thank you. Jane. Hi, this is a question for Jason and uh, the implementation of your cure or planned implementation. Um, whether, I, I don't know if I missed this, if it's for what level of students and what sort of outside of lab time might be necessary in order to carry out the project. I'm guessing there's some, you know, protein purification involved. So whether they, whether students need to be able to access the lab to grow up their cultures or, uh, I don't know if that's too much um, detail, but you just, um, tips or uh, thoughts yeah. on your implementation? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So we're, you know, we're working on putting putting together an implementation for fall. Um, so not all of the questions have been answered, but it's going to be for mostly seniors. Um, well, I think all seniors actually. Um, we do have designated equipment for for growing protein and purifying it that they will use. We're um, and also designated equipment for other molecular, basic molecular biology techniques that they've learned in earlier biochemistry labs. Um, and I think the plan is to give them an opportunity to, you know, this, this project is, is kind of uh, well set up for a cure because, you know, they can pick any mutation and it's kind of a parallel uh, workflow to get to an answer. Um, but, you know, they can have different kinds of hypotheses that uh, inform, you know, the mutation that they pick. Um, there's a lot of different reasons that mutations can have different effects. So, um, so in terms of uh, how, how they're going to um, kind of come, come to that uh, themselves and decide which mutations to pick, um, that's uh, something, that's something we're figuring out, um, how much time is going to be spent kind of away from the lab uh, coming up with a proposal. I think a proposal, a short proposal is something that will be due probably in the first like four weeks. And so they'll pick a mutation and then start working on it. I hope that helps. If you have any questions, just send me an email if you're a cure person, uh, I'd like to connect, so. <laughs> yeah, I'd be happy. All right, I would love to do that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
Ava, I have a question regarding the impedance measurements and the sign language part. Sure. Um, what, um, tell me a little bit about how reproducible it is. I think that's really a key. And because you would think that almost any type of movement might give some false readings. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a very good point. So having it reproducible, we, we did a few things to solve that. The first thing is we, we asked the person uh, wearing the bracelet to, to hold their hand at a relaxed position without any movement. And then we compared any movement to this base position, like the, the hand without any movement laid on a flat surface, that, that would be our base baseline. And then we detected the changes uh, to the muscles and to the tendons based on comparison to this uh, base state. Other things that can be done, and uh, there, there has been many papers on it, is use of like machine learning and uh, a smart algorithm to remove the, the errors that is because of like motion artifacts or um, uh, any uh, changes outside of the normal, normal uh, pull and push of the muscles that we are expecting. So the smart algorithm can be used to uh, having a baseline and uh, averaging our data. One, one other thing that we did is we, when we were measuring the data, we took like 16 samples on other variations, 64 score samples, and we average it. The, the sampling can be very fast because the sinusoidal wave can be fast. You can have up to like 64, uh, 64 samples in half a second. And if you average that, you get a more smooth data. I mean, I would think given the amount of the intricacies of the hand uh, and all the muscles and everything that are that are built into it. I mean, it, it really is a, a phenomenon, the hand uh, and just our ability to move and the variances in the movement of one's hand could cause so many different errors. Uh, but certainly, you know, AI or, or ML could help in, in easing those, those false readings. Thank you. Questions for our speakers? Yes, Luella. So I have another question of curiosity, and this one's for Jason. Um, I was just curious. So there was one experiment where the researcher looked at, I guess, um, binding, I think, of uh, how like how how a mutation would affect the binding of a protein to another protein. And there was like one line, and there was a new line around it for the um, mutated protein, and it made that's like kind of like an S shape around the original one. And you said it was like five time like it bound, it binded like five times less or so and i was wondering mm -hmm. what you were looking at in that graph um that yeah. indicated it yeah so the five times less comes from the midpoint of the two curves the distance between them and how that relates to the x-axis is the concentration of of protein that's used and so it's five times more protein that it takes to get to the midpoint of that curve in the mutant version which is the red line thank you mm -hmm. That's, it's called a KD or dissociation constant is what we're measuring there. Awesome, nice to know, thank you. Jason. Yeah. <laughs> is it okay if I ask a question uh, for, for Ava? Um, I had a question about the impedance sensor. Um, just looking looking at the heat map of the the different kinds of motions uh, was kind of intriguing. Um, and you said that this might be used for uh, you know com commercial uses maybe. And I wondered, is there like potentially an application of this in in athletics maybe, where um, you know there's like certain repetitive motions that are yeah that are trainable. Sure, sure. So. Uh, one proposal that we have, and uh, fingers crossed it's going to be accepted, is that we're implementing these sensors in, in a uh, printed tissue 
uh, for uh, like people that they have like limbs printed out and that it's it's getting more common or uh, to to wear it as a uh, as elect we call it e skin electrical skin as a very comfortable patch so for for people who are doing exercises or people who are doing rehabilitation after injuries so we can detect the changes in their muscles we are adding a strain sensors we are adding a sweat sensing and having like a wholesome system for for athletes So question, Jackie, what might be some of your research questions that you would like to have solved using utilizing VR in some of your geology type of scenarios? Yeah, there's a lot of questions to still uh, work on in this space. And one is, if it is effective <laughs> at achieving some of the spatial reasoning skills that students often develop in the field itself. But again, I'm not trying to necessarily like replace the field with virtual reality experiences only. And so one thing I'm really interested in investigating is if having exposure before a field, uh, in-person field experience in virtual reality enhances the feelings of um, like emotional and physical safety for students in the field, if it enhances their uh, what, what they get out of the field experience. We, as a geologist, I spend weeks planning before my field expeditions and we rarely give that for our students in training. Um, so I think that's one space. I could also be interested in understanding in, you know, with my computer science, collaborator, Stacey Doerr, she's a spatial scientist. She, her um, main area of research is understanding how um, people with visual impairments navigate spaces. And so one thing that we're also interested in looking at is how do, um, how does an expert geologist like work through a lab in VR? Can we literally see where they are spending their time? And then can we use that to enhance how we're training our sort of novice intro geology students? So I'm interested in, you know, increasing success for everyone and gaining some of these field skills and, and these synthesis and spatial reasoning skills, but also can this help broad, can this be, a, can we lower the barrier to entry of geology, which sort of has a, uh, branding problem like you have to be white and like hiking to be a geologist which is not true not true do you see possible different types of questions and benefits to the use of vr before they do the field experience versus after because i think the a lot definitely maybe, maybe people have been looking at the before a lot which is great but I'm trying to look at it, you know, after the fact. Um, what 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 do you see? What might be some of those differences? Well, I think the after is really a way to. I like I said in my short talk, I get their geologic maps or their geologic reports that they write. And I think we just had the best 12 hours in the field and they were making so many connections. And when I see how they took, they went home, a week later, they write this paper in 13 minutes, they hand it in and I'm just like, oh God, no, like you, what happened? What happened to those connections that you were drawing? You kind of missed the boat here. But if we could, if they had the opportunity to then revisit those sites, could we, you know, like, students need to be told something four times. So maybe they should have to experience something in the field four times. And we can't go to the field four times at one location. No one will do that. But in virtual reality, especially go to this website, play around in this game for a little bit. And you know, you can, I really think that would enhance spatial retention and, and understanding to get four visits to a place instead of just one in-person experience. But we'd, I'd love to test that. No one's tested that.
Great, thank you. Gonna give some time back to everybody. Great talks by everyone. I'm glad and hope everyone enjoyed. Very, very, very interesting. It's always good to have people from different disciplines speak uh, one after each other because you get a, a nice, not to compare to each other, but really you get to see the interdisciplinarity of, uh, of STEM and non-STEM uh, all at once. Uh, to those here, do not hesitate to reach out to any of our speakers, as this could lead to a collaboration and maybe a future proposal. A few reminders, uh, we have uh, next week on the 21st at 10 a.m. Uh, another webcast on United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Certainly what everyone spoke about today uh, overlaps uh, quite a bit with the SDGs. And our next virtual cafe is on May 18th, same time, always Wednesday uh, of the month, not every Wednesday, but usually the third Wednesday or so of the month, and that's at 11 a.m. Thank you for attending today's cafe. Looking forward to seeing you at a future event. Take care and have a good time the rest of the week. Bye-bye. <laughs>